Um, our speakers today, they, they come from a range of backgrounds and there's, there's a range of topics and expertise and lived experiences that people are going to be talking about. And I'm really, really delighted to have them here. These are people who I felt very lucky. I, I got this event and started thinking, who do I want to invite? And these were the first three people I contacted because I wanted to use. And they all said yes. So I'm feeling very, very lucky. So I'm really excited. Um, without further ado, I'll pass you over to our first speaker, uh, which is Harry Sewell. So Harry is the founder and director of HS Co uh, Consultancy and is a former executive director of health and social care in the NHS. He's a writer and speaker in his specialist area of social justice, equalities, ethnicity, race, and culture in mental health. Uh, Harry is an honorary senior visiting fellow at the University of Central Lancashire and was the co-founder and chair of the National Social Care Strategic Network for Mental Health until November 2010. Harry's had various books, articles, and chapters published uh, with new ma uh, material emerging regularly and he's increasingly studying forms of masculinity and the possibilities in many aspects of practice to recognize the intersections between masculinity and other elements of identity. So can we, can we give Harry a, a warm welcome, please? Is that my one? Is that my one? Hi, good evening. Absolute pleasure to be with you. One of the striking things when we talk about issues of identity and associations we have between particular social groups and a set of attributes is that sometimes these things are so deep-rooted in us that even when we get to a point where we feel we've revised our value base or our perspectives, at times of stress, we sometimes default. A typical example of that might be if, for example, you're a man who's heterosexual and you've really reconsidered what it means to kind of live within the norms of society's views about what it means to be male and masculine, you might kind of spend a lot of time investing in feminist thought and critiques and have shifted your position on what that means. And you may, in pursuit of that, try and be really equal in the way in which you operate in your relationship with your partner if you're heterosexual. However, it could be that if you're out and there's an incident that emerges, your instinct to protect might just come to the fore in that moment and you act like a typical bloke protecting your female partner and you might get into some kind of a ruckus. And then afterwards, you might critique, well, why was it me who stepped forward and assumed it should be my role to be in the protector role? Um, and that's kind of very typical of how we are as human beings, that there is a kind of intellectual capacity to revise our views, but somehow things that have become part of our identities, the ways in which we see the world, become so deep-rooted, and that's kind of part of the underpinning of what I wanted to kind of investigate here. So the subject that I wanted to cover in the next 13 minutes or so is kind of looking at race and mental health, and then to kind of weave in some views about masculinity in that and to kind of understand the intersections between the two. So firstly, when we kind of think about race or ethnicity, I just kind of wanted to get us to critique the language we use because often nowadays we talk about BAME communities or some people say BAME, which to me is anathema, but you, know, you kind of hear that. And you might even hear second and third generation or fourth generation. And the language is pretty confused. First of all, we talk about BAME communities as if there's some kind of homogeneity amongst this group. And actually, once you start to think about it, you realize that you know, it could include black Jamaicans, Saudis, um, Ugandans, you could include Japanese. And you kind of think culturally, the diversity in just those that I've mentioned is so huge that when you consider the world population, the term BAME, doesn't really describe a group where there's much homogeneity other than the experience of having been othered. That's the consistent theme. Other than that, it doesn't really hold as a concept. The idea of second and third generation immigrants doesn't really work either. When you stop and think about it, of course, if you were born in this country, you're not an immigrant. So to prefix any description with that term is a confusion. And we just need to kind of get better, I think, 
well, not that we need to, but it may help us if we constantly critique the language and to understand what's underpinning the use of terms like second and third generation. Because, of course, people talk about migrant communities and include so-called second and third generation people, and they're not migrant communities, they're British citizens, and part of the process is othering. To jump forward a little bit, the reason why that kind of thing is really relevant is because even though the data does show that immigrants experienced an elevated rate of mental health problems compared with um, people who were born in this country, so-called second and third generation immigrants have an even more elevated rate of use of the services. And some of the investigations have kind of questioned whether or not part of the reason behind that is, of course, there's something about migration that kind of disrupts, and there is something about the kinds of people who might migrate may already be the kind of people who are more open to some of the pressures. But there is also something about, if you're born in this country, and you're holding a contradiction of, well, you're a citizen here, you carry the responsibilities of being a citizen, but at will, we might describe you as an immigrant then that creates something which is known as a double bind. And if you read the kind of work of you know, anyone in the field of mental health, you'll understand that the double bind is a very psychologically toxic experience because you're getting a push-pull. And in your lived experience, you may already know um, how problematic that might be. So underneath the term BAME, just to kind of investigate that, you can kind of look at ethnicity, and that is really just kind of describing um, something, it comes from the Greek word for tribe, and it describes how people identify with one another and will include a uh, geographical root, um, it might include language, it might inclu include faith, um, and it may include something of what we consider to be race. I will come back to race in a minute. Culture, um, the pedestrian way of um, talking about culture is the way in which we do things around here. It's the unspoken rules that hold communities together as um, Simon Fernando describes, it's the non-material glue. Okay, and then race. Today is not the time for it, but race, of course, is a social construct. Um, we can't really investigate it too deeply, and this is one of the things I talk about that we hold on to very closely, as if it's a reality. And there is a lot more diversity within what we consider to be racial groups than there is across racial groups. And around the world, there is no consensus about what races there are. In South Africa, where you might kind of have blacks, colors, Asians, and white, you actually don't have that. In America, you've got Hispanics as a racial group, which we don't have in this country. And when you investigate it, you realize that actually, we've constructed the idea of races, and it doesn't really work scientifically. Um, so this just finally illustrates my point about the term. When people say, oh, what do people from BAME communities need? Um, and you look at that picture and you kind of think, yeah, there's significant diversity just in those two people. If you'd included a man and a woman, you could kind of see how complex it would be. And then you consider the world population and you realize that the term doesn't hold much water. So when we look at the issues of race in mental health, in relation to people from you know, the various um, backgrounds known as racialized minorities, there are five domains in which inequalities manifest themselves. The first is the experience of factors that are closely correlated with poorer mental health. So the things that will be familiar with you, if you're kind of poorer, um, if you experience more violence, you experience more discrimination, um, you've got a kind of poor educational background, those kind of factors in the science of mental health are kind of very closely correlated and it stands to reason if you're from a population who experiences those factors far more frequently in larger numbers, then of course it's going to have an impact at population levels on mental health. The second domain in which inequalities manifest themselves is in relation to services. Um, often they're the services that people least want from mental health services. And people from certain black, Asian and minority backgrounds tend to be um, utilizing those services. I use utilize rather than use because use almost implies that there's some intent and choice. And sometimes these services are imposed rather than people you know, actively seeking them out. So that might include being in a secure environment or getting high doses of medication. 
Then the third domain is about lower access rates to services that people do usually want, which might be kind of talking treatments. And then you've got poorer outcomes from the services that are provided. So we might expect that if the way in which we provide mental health services is fair and equal, then people who experience those services should have equitable rates of outcomes. And the data shows that that actually doesn't happen. That if you're from a racialized background, then actually you end up with poor outcomes from many of the interventions. And finally, there is something about the relationships that you would kind of hope that the way in which our services are run means that whoever you are, you have an equal opportunity of having a positive relationship with those who are providing treatment and care. And the evidence suggests that that isn't true. So they're the big issues when you get into the field of race and mental health. So I was just uh, going to go into intersectionality, right? So there is an issue around race. But also, of course, today we're looking at maleness and masculinity. And one of the important factors to understand is that often when we see a salient aspect of someone's identity, we focus in on that. But we all bear many dimensions to who we are. And Kimberly Crenshaw, who was, uh, she describes herself as a woman of color, in 1989, first wrote a piece on it, and then kind of in 94, developed it. This idea of inter intersectionality, and it tries to bring together the fact that people not only have multiple identities, but there are forms of discrimination that relate to the particular configuration of identities that you might be. So it isn't just that, for example, you're a woman, and you might experience discrimination, and you're a lesbian, and you experience discrimination, and they're A plus B. There is something unique about that configuration of identities that means that the discrimination experience is unique to you. Um, so that's what Kimberly Crenshaw was trying to kind of get across. So let's kind of consider um, how it plays out. Well, first of all, what is masculinity? There's a definition there. It's a social construct, um, and it really is a set of rules given to boys and men about how we should behave, and that's policed. And it's policed through insults, it's policed through keeping on showing a certain form of being as the norm. So in our media, in our films, in our art forms, we'll keep seeing a particular image of what it means to be male, which therefore polices in some way our expectations around what alternatives might look like. Another way of saying it is, if you keep reinforcing something as a norm, you then imply that something else is abnormal. Um, so that's what masculinity is. And patriarchy is played out, and that is the kind of mode where male identity and the male norms are the dominant, and that's socially constructed. And our politics, our faiths, our religions, um, our institutions, and the law even constructs that. I'll give you a very simple um, thing to hold on to. If I were to say to you, Okay, guys, we're going to have a break in two minutes. Most people probably wouldn't flinch. Unless, of course, you think, well, a, a few years ago, we used guys to refer to men. And if I were to say, okay, ladies, we're going to break in five minutes, the men in the room would say, well, why can't we have a break as well? Maybe. And I could say, oh, I meant it in an inclusive way. And you kind of think, well, actually, we don't really use female gender pronouns or terms in an inclusive way for men. Um, and that on its own might not be problematic, but when you put it in the context of the norms for the male terms, the male constructs to be the norm against which the rest of society is measured, including women, then you kind of understand that a simple term like that is very loaded. Someone said to me, um, you could ask a heterosexual man who feels pretty comfortable with just saying guys in an inclusive way, how many guys have you dated? And then you kind of think, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe the term doesn't really work in that inclusive way. And that's kind of important of understanding how our language embeds the idea of maleness being the norm. I don't need to kind of push you too far for you to kind of think about legal language or think about the language of chairman or 
you know, most terms, if I say football's on tonight, we'll automatically imagine we're talking about the male game. That's the kind of thing I mean. It's embedded so much in our systems, not just in our discourse. So I kind of want to move um, a bit faster into this and kind of explore masculinity a little bit um, and talk about Michael Kaufman's um, idea of the triangle of violence and link this in to mental health. Because what Kaufman was saying is that, of course, we see a lot of evidence that maleness is associated with forms of violence, either in warfare or in um, civil society. But actually, the first act of violence is against oneself. So I want to kind of illustrate what I kind of mean by that. As a boy, say a six-year-old, something happens. It could be that you've fallen over. It could be that you got told off by an adult. It could be that you sold yourself. It could be whatever. And in that moment, there might be shame and embarrassment, which is felt. And it is felt in a really alive, probably dynamic way. And that leads to shame, of course, embarrassment. You might want to kind of recoil. You want to kind of go on your own. But then there are forms of masculinity that are fed into that. The kind of terminology that we might be familiar with, don't be a sissy, don't be a girl, come on boys, don't cry, pull yourself together, man up, all of that stuff. Sometimes it's spoken explicitly, but after a while you just kind of have a sense of knowing, as um, social psychologists would refer to it. It's kind of you know that. That kicks in. And what happens is that that boy then expresses what initially was felt as shame and embarrassment it becomes expressed as anger. Now, one of the problems is, is that if we keep on doing that, policing that ability for a boy to feel what he's supposed to feel, with the kind of language of man up, don't be a sissy, and all the other terms that we could kind of throw out there as insults, this happens. The this I'm talking about is that over time, that child, that boy, forgets that ability to feel that stuff. So the trigger happens, and it bypasses the guilt, the shame, the hurt, and it goes straight to anger. And in part, what that has required is the killing off of that part of ourselves that felt something. And it's done as a protective mechanism because of the social context, which I've just described, about how masculinities are policed. But that's why Kaufman would talk about, well, the first act of violence is denying part of who we are. So let's kind of reflect on some of the meaning behind this. There is a view that men are more emotionally regulated than women, right? Now, of course, if you look at convictions for um, deaths caused by dangerous driving, kind of erratic behavior, 95% um, are related to men. I've got the data for the states, not here. Um, but between 1982 and 2019, of the mass shootings, 103 were by men, three by women, and one was a kind of partnership. And then this is the big one. Of all the people, who die by suicide, 75% of them are men. Now, I could have pulled out a whole load of data to illustrate the point I'm making, but it becomes evident when you look at it that actually the narrative that men are highly regulated emotionally isn't borne out by the data if you subject it to that scrutiny. And then you think, well, how have we come to the point where this is the narrative, this is the discourse that runs through our society, it runs through our literature, it runs through our art forms, it runs through what's printed in our media, and it becomes internalized. And the process is the suppression of who we are as men. So when we see people from particular racial or ethnic backgrounds 
And we're working knowing that, of course, there are these variations that I touched on briefly. We also need to kind of draw on Kimberly Crenshaw's work and think about, well, how does race and ethnicity intersect with masculinity? And how do different communities interpret what it means to be male? And what are the consequences of that? So we might see, if you kind of go back to the slide, where we're thinking about, well, what's being killed off here? We might see anger. We might see forms of behavior that are problematic and might be considered to be deviance. But if we explore with curiosity what has led to this point, we might get to some truths. Because why might someone make the choice, not consciously, but make the choice to kill off parts of themselves? So that's all I really wanted to kind of share with you, is to kind of try and bring together the idea of the disparities around race and ethnicity with the male identity, and to prompt our thinking about, well, how can we get into that material with a deeper understanding, and to have some of the kind of constructs like intersectionality, and what I've just kind of shared with you from Michael Kaufman's work, and to have conversations with people that are a lot more curious. And I'll close just by kind of sharing what I meant about some things that are normal. And it doesn't relate directly to the subject matter, but you'll kind of see how difficult it can be for us to move positions. I was a meeting, I was in a meeting this morning with someone who wanted to commission my work looking at unconscious bias training. And we were together for about an hour and 15 minutes. And she was kind of saying, we really need to kind of get into the subject very deeply in our organization. And she understood unconscious bias and really worked around the subject herself and was considering delivering the training course to her workforce, but she said she was going to ask me to do it. We had a meeting for um, an hour and 50 minutes on that subject, and at the end, I said to her, my mum's just over from Jamaica, um, she's with my sister, and I'm going to go and see my sister, and she said, I'm going to go see my mum um, at my sister's, and she says, oh great, I bet there's going to be um, some lovely food there for you. I thought, that's kind of so funny. We've just spent an hour and 50 minutes exploring the subject of unconscious bias. But of course, there is this kind of default in our minds that, okay, well, your mum is going to be there and going to be cooking food. If that was my dad, I'm not sure that it would evo evoke the same kind of response. And I only kind of throw that anecdote in because it happened today and it's live. But it also shows that even when my colleague was invested in the subject, of critiquing how we make assumptions and we have associations between particular aspects of identity and particular attributes, even when we've been critiquing that for an hour and 15 minutes, just a slip of the mind and we default to our norms. So when we think about masculinities and we think about ethnicities, that's one of the things we really need to practice is what are the associations we have with particular social groups or particular genders and how how we might lapse into expecting those things to become manifest. So that's all I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much, Harry, for that. So next, we've got Dave Chawner, who is a number one best-selling author, award-winning stand-up uh, presenter and mental health campaigner. His recent book, Weight Expectations, became a bestseller just three days after being released, enjoying rave reviews from the Mail on Sunday and features in The Telegraph, Metro, Indy 100, and many national newspapers. Um, Dave's appeared on BBC, ITV, Channel 4, um, and such shows as BBC Breakfast, Lorraine, and Victoria Derbyshire, um, as well as numerous radio stations and lots of other stuff, having written for national newspapers such as The Guardian, The Telegraph, the Metro and a load of magazines, including Men's Health, which is probably the most relevant to today. Um, and he's also received an award for his show, um, Normally Abnormal, at the Houses of Parliament in 2014. I'm really excited that we can have Dave uh, here with us to kind of talk about his activism and his experiences. So yeah, let's hand over to, to Dave. 
Thank you very much. What a lovely uh, intro, uh, but I'm just going to, it's, it's not going to be that good. Um, so just to set your expectations, it's just nice to be out of the house. But I'm here because a couple of years ago uh, I did a show and it was all about uh, my kind of history uh, with, uh, with anorexia, right? And that was what I did uh, the show on. And um, something I did want to share was like, yeah, because I was very lucky that show uh, did get five stars. Uh, if you add them all up. And since then, I've gone on, and, and like, like Richie says, I've done bits and bobs of telly, but something I think that's really, really relevant, right, is uh, I did, um, I did uh, BBC Breakfast recently, not showing off. I'm only saying this, right, and I think this is where I want to start, because whenever you do bits and bobs of TV and radio, there's always someone that, like, calls you up, tells you about the show, asks you any questions, right? And this producer rang me up, uh, and they said, I'm really excited to talk to you because I've never had any mental health. And I said, what? Mean, I've never had any <laughs> mental health. None of my family have ever had any mental health. In fact, I don't know anyone that's had any mental health. And I was like, what are you, a fucking toaster? Right? And it made me, it kind of, it makes you realize that like mental health and mental illness are a lot like Ant and Deck, right? They're two separate things, but no one ever distinguishes between the two until there's a problem, right? And I kind of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's how it went down in Newcastle as well. I, because the thing is, I realise that people get uncomfortable, but my thing that I'm really, really strong about is we know that one in four people has mental illness, but you know what, four in four people has mental health. Why do we speak about the negative rather than the positive? So bear with me, I will talk about my mental illness before I progress through to talk about my mental health. So I did uh, have uh, anorexia, and um, that sort of developed around the age uh, of 17. And when I say developed, a lot of people, um, I think in hindsight, you can clean things up too much. You can make a really easy kind of uh, ladybird book kind of narrative. And actually, for me, it was quite messy. Like, I didn't realize that I was anorexic for quite a long time. Uh, it seemed natural to me what I was uh, doing. And it took me a long time to realize that I was anorexic. And it kind of became an addiction, an obsession, and a control, right? And I think we always talk about control. I want to kind of unpack that a little bit. Uh, I think I started developing it when I was um, sort of a lot of exams. I was doing a lot of exams at that time. And I couldn't absolutely guarantee that I would get an A on that paper. I couldn't guarantee that Durham would let me in. But I could guarantee that I could eat X amount of calories. I could guarantee that I could do X amount of exercise. And it kind of became a subliminal coping mechanism. Um, and I sort of talk about this a lot. One of my favorite stories, because it is genuinely true, uh, was I became obsessed with exercise. And uh, I always used to go out to my room, and I, I, I constantly was doing push-ups, sit-ups, and whatever. And when I started talking about this, I said to my mom, why did you never say anything to me about the exercise? And my mom said, well, Dave, in our defense, when your teenage son keeps on running up to his room, and all you can hear is rhythmical banging, followed by repeated grunting. You tend not to ask questions, right? And I thought that was wonderful because there's so many things going on mentally that other people can intuit differently. And I think one of the things that I really want to get across is it took me years to realize that I was anorexic. Uh, because it was kind of something that I'd heard banded around, but it seemed very dramatic and didn't really appeal to what I was sort of going through. I hate to admit, and I don't mean to be triggering in any way, shape, or form, uh, I got uh, a uh, kick out of it. And uh, that, that's a lot of, there's a lot of guilt saying that, and I really want to heavily caveat that. What I mean by that, and I am in no way promoting eating disorders, I am definitely not condoning anorexia, and I am not trying to make anyone uncomfortable, but I think it's really important in health literacy to actually look at these things in a very rounded way. And there was a power for me to, you know, sort of restrict more. There was a power for me to exercise. There was a power for me to look at a well-stocked fridge and not eat. And the only reason I bring that up is I think it's actually much more rounded to sort of say, oh, there is something, a short-term, and I have to emphasize a very short-term benefit for a long-term detriment. But it's kind of like drugs. If you say to kids, don't do drugs, they'll smoke a spliff and they'll go, oh, people are fucking idiots. This is great, right? But if you say to them, actually, over time, it can lead to paranoia, it can lead to psychosis, it can actually, you know, then they're like, oh, yeah, it might be nice in the time, but long, 
long ways. I'm not making sense. But that was, uh, yeah, that was kind of how it was for me. And I, uh, I kind of, it's a really, a really kind of like um, caustic thing because even when I did realize that I was anorexic, I never got help because I never felt anorexic enough. And this is something that we see uh, a lot with uh, mental illness, the kind of imposter syndrome. Uh, and I'd only ever read stories of like people being minutes away from death, being ng tubed, and I couldn't relate to that. And also a lot of the narrative that I read as well was to do with um, women uh, and to do with girls, which subsequently is mental, genuinely mental, because I, uh, I was reading about this today, the first diagnosed uh, medical condition of anorexia was a man. Uh, the physician was called Richard Morton in uh, eight, no, 1639. Lord Byron, by today's standards, was uh, heavily anorexic, and this is written about quite a lot. He actually later on had said that his, uh, he attributed a lot of his uh, creativity to his anorexia, and actually, um, from when he was at Cambridge University, he used to binge, and then he used to fast. He used to wear woolen shirts to kind of uh, make him sweat. He used to play cricket and run all the time. He also did uh, a lot more um, harmful things of which I won't divulge now because I don't want to tip share. But the point is uh, that actually uh, anorexia is a big deal, has affected men. I lost my train of thought. Um, but yeah, so I didn't really get, um, I didn't really get any help for it because I never felt anorexic enough. And then I kind of uh, realized that I needed to engage in treatment. Uh, and the reason I read that is something that I would say is uh, anorexia has the highest mortality rate of any mental illness. Not a lot of people realize that. And actually, as many as a quarter of anorexics are men. Uh, but I also think as well, some of the narrative around eating disorders is a little bit blurred because uh, I knew that. And um, without being too, without making anyone uncomfortable, I knew the road that I was going down. And without sharing too much, I uh, sped that up in different ways. And I'd started writing the letters for, you know, when I wasn't around anymore and I started trying to prepare that transition. Um, but the only thing that really got me, the only thing that I made me engage in treatment, because I actually refused treatment four times, um, and the only thing that made me uh, engage in treatment was because I kind of got depression. And I'll never forget one of my, uh, my doctor, <laughs> who was like at the end of his tether by this point, uh, said, you wouldn't expect your laptop to work if you didn't charge it. You can't expect your brain to work if you don't feed it. And that was what made me engage in treatment. And I was like, whoa, that's crazy. Because when I was sort of talking about this very openly, I, you know, you get a bit of pushback. Um, like a lot of people kept on saying to me, you don't look anorexic, right? And obviously anorexia is to do with the brain, it's not to do with the body. And subsequently, if anyone says anything like that to you, like you don't look anorexic, uh, the correct response is, well, you don't look like a fucking moron. Uh, but here we are, we're both surprised. And <laughs> one, of the, one of the most unhelpful things uh, anyone ever said to me, it's genuinely true, someone said, uh, Dave, I don't think you're really anorexic. Uh, I think you're a white, middle-class male who has so much unchecked privilege, you need to create something in order to feel special. I said, Jesus, mom. And I, it's a very cheap joke. It wasn't, it genuinely wasn't my mum. It was actually quite a big uh, reviewer uh, in Edinburgh. And so I've kind of seen that. But one thing that I think I'm really, really, really uh, keen on is focusing on intent rather than content. Now, you raised the Daily Mail. And I think this is amazing because I think generally in this country you have a very right-wing media who try and make the left look like some absurdist pantomime because that actually fits their end. If you can actually try and make the left seem ridiculous, then you are kind of on a winning streak. And actually, I think nowadays, because the right-wing media push so much, we forget intent and we just look at content, don't we, right? And people are like, oh, you can't say that, you can't say that. And that's actually pushing by a right-wing agenda. And I genuinely think one of the best things that anyone ever said to me, right? And this is a little tip that I always give. One of the best people I ever met when I told about my eating disorder, because I got diagnosed as severely clinically anorexic on the 23rd of December 2013, so just before Christmas, not ideal, and went home and that. My dad was the best person I met about my eating disorder because he said this, and I thought this was beautiful. We sat down. He never really talked about mental health or anything. And he said to me, Dave, 
I'm going to be honest, I don't get it. And just that was brilliant. He was the first person that said, I don't get it. And I said, you know what? I don't get it either. Because one of the things that really frustrates me about the mental health narrative now, especially with men, we don't give anyone, really, I don't want to genderize the issue too much, we don't give anyone uh, emotional intelligence. We don't give anyone uh, emotional language to explain what's going on in your brain. If you went to the doctor and you said, I've got a pain in my stomach, they'd say, what soil is it? And you go, oh, I don't know, it's like, it's throbbing, it's stabbing, it's localized. If you went to the doctor and said, I've got a pain in my brain, they said, what sort of pain is it? You go, I don't fucking know. And I think that's really difficult. I actually used to live with a guy who, unfortunately, was severely clinically anorexic. Uh, severely, um, so, I don't know. Uh, he was severely uh, suicidal. Uh, and I loved that bloke to bits. And I was actually put on his suicide watch. And I said, why did you never tell me anything about this? And he genuinely said, the reason I didn't say anything was you kept on asking me how I was. And I didn't know what to say. And I was like, that's a really good... That's actually a really good point, and he's, uh, he's, he's actually kind of heavily autistic, so he's very good at numbers, uh, <laughs> some stereotypes, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's offensive, but now, instead of asking him how he is, I say, look, on a scale of one to ten, one being like properly shit, ten being great, what number do you feel? And he feels a lot more comfortable with that, he's like, oh, I'm a, like, I'm a six or a seven. You're like, oh, okay, that's all right then. You know, and I think that's a better way of doing it. And I think the reason that it annoys me so much is we, one of the things that we're told to combat mental health is to just talk. And if you can just talk, absolutely brilliant. But it annoys me so much that one of the first diagnostic criteria of pretty much m any mental illness is an inability to communicate, right? The cerebral cortex in the center of your brain starts shutting down, right? So the synapses stop firing. So saying to someone with mental illness, just talk, is like saying to someone with lung cancer, so I'll get it off your chest. You never do that, would you? Right? But we kind of do that with mental health. So that's why I think emotional intelligence, emotional language, mental health education, and making health literacy really engaging. I think that's one of the things with blokes. Because one of the things that I found when I told people that I uh, was mentally ill uh, or had a mental illness, uh, people uh, kept on treating me differently. Right? They kept on talking really quietly uh, and <laughs> I, I genuinely joked up until the age of like 17, I thought all librarians were mentally ill. Because like people just talk really quietly, and that's how people talk to me. And I don't, I don't think that's how, I don't want to, again, I don't want to genderize, and I don't want to speak for a whole gender, especially as the lines are getting blurry now. But like, I don't think, you know, sort of like everyone likes to have a laugh. And I think, like, blokes are kind of exactly, as Harry was saying, like, kind of fine-tuned to do many things. And one of them is perhaps not talk in emotional language. So fight the battles on the fields that people can fight on. So actually, that's why I think comedy should be used to talk about that. Because I think when people are laughing, they're listening. When they're listening, they can learn. And you can use that to disseminate seemingly very dry public health information. Uh, which is why I, uh, why in the book, so I wrote a book about anorexia. And this is genuinely true. Uh, I originally wanted to call it The Real Hunger Games. Uh, I thought that was a good title. Apparently, you couldn't call it that. Uh, so I had to call it Weight Expectations. But two of the things that I was really, really keen uh, key to do, one of them was to give actual, tangible coping mechanisms. And I think that's really important. And something that I sort of, I give different coping mechanisms in the show. Uh, but I, I, I just kind of say two things quickly. One of them uh, is we always talk about one of the coping mechanisms I find very useful is to think about what your warning signs are for bad mental health. And I, I get that, and I think that's incredibly useful. However, spin that on its head. Make it fun. Make people engage. Think about no one ever talks about what are your signs for good mental health. And kind of like that's actually... That's actually quite fun. When you think about like actually being better, being a better version of yourself, that's, that's amazing. So I think that's really, really great. Uh, and, and a sort of a silly example, a very silly example of that, but I will leave with this because it's one of my, um, my favourite stories. Uh, I used to present a breakfast show, long story, don't really have time for it, but the reason that's relevant is we used to get loads of these press releases. Now, I can't tell you any press release I ever got, bar one, right? And it was from the Mental Health Foundation. And I think this shows you how much comedy as coping in order to engage people can really be used, right? In the press release, what they tried to say was, 
the easiest, cheapest, most effective way to regulate your mental health is to get a good night's sleep, right? Now, I understand for some people it's not that easy. So in this press release, they've given some hints, tips, and ideas on how to get a good night. And what they meant to say was, don't take any Kindles, any mobile phones, any laptops with you into the bedroom because that will stimulate you. That will like, you know, kind of wake up your brain uh, and you'll find it increasingly harder to get a d good night. But what they actually said in a press release that I read out seven times on The Breakfast Show, and I can still quote verbatim, what they actually said was, don't use any gadgets with you in the bedroom because that will stimulate you and you'll find it increasingly harder to get off. Now, what a ridiculous thing to say, but I can still remember that two years ago. So I don't think it should always be mental illness. I think it should be mental health. I don't think that it should always be negative. I think it should be positive. And I don't always think it should be the one in four. I think it should be the four in four. Men, women, and trans trying to make sure that they are mentally healthy rather than pulling them out of mental illness. And I just personally think that is really important. And I'm going to sit down now. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dave. That was brilliant. So we've got our last speaker now, and then we're going to open the floor to, to some questions. So now I'm really pleased to invite um, Kane and Miles to speak to us. So he's actually now currently one of our students, technically, which is very exciting, although I wasn't aware of this when I first uh, came across Keenan's story. Um, but Keenan is a former professional rugby player who toured Argentina in England, uh, with England in 2013. Uh, and on during a mid-season break, uh, during his pl playing career, Keenan came close to taking his own life. Since hitting his lowest point, Kanan has worked hard on his own mental health and well-being and is now in a good place. And he's just uh, starting a DPhil uh, here in Oxford at the Department of Psychiatry researching mindfulness and mental health in athletes. I think this is a really, really sport and mental health are two things that we don't kind of... We should talk about more, but when we do, we kind of talk in quite a skewed way. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what kanan has got to say. Um, so yes, welcome our final speaker, please. Hello, so um, you all know me now, my name's Kiernan. I played professional rugby for the best part of 17 years. Um, and very recently made the decision to retire, partly because I'm a bit old and battered, um, and then partly because I got the opportunity to come here uh, and study a DPhil. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself, my career, my experience with depression as a professional athlete. Um, the things that I did to help overcome that depression or, or help um, take myself out of the, the dark hole that I was in. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about my research and then how that um, is or can be applied to, to the wider world. So my story really begins, I suppose, I was about halfway through my career. I was 26, 27. I'd been on tour uh, with England. I was, I was playing at Wasps, one of the best teams in the country, playing in... Uh, grand finals, playing in European semi-finals. And from the outside, everything was going really well. And then an event in my personal life, so for me it was the breakdown of a relationship. Um, it kind of threw everything that I thought I knew about myself and about my life into a bit of turmoil. And I think it's important at this point to know that for me it was the breakdown of a relationship, but for, for others it, it could be anything. It could be a friend or family member becoming ill, passing away, problems with our jobs, or for some people it's, there is no tangible reason why we start questioning things about ourselves, why we become depressed, why we become anxious. And what happened in my case is that I'd built up over the years an idea of myself that I was this big, strong guy. I was, I was, I was the epitome of masculinity. I was a, a working class, coming from a working class family from Huddersfield. I was a rugby player, I was tough, I was hard. And then I went through this breakup and I started having these, what I now know to be very natural emotions. I was feeling sad, I was feeling guilty, I was feeling remorseful of some of the things that I'd done. And I started feeling quite, quite low. And those feelings that I was having absolutely ran at odds with what I thought about myself as this big, tough, hard bloke. And then you put that into the environment that I was in, an extremely highly competitive professional uh, rugby team where 
as Harry spoke about, the, the, the typical ways that men interact with each other are being forced consistently. You don't show any sign of weakness. You don't show any, anything other than absolute toughness. It became impossible for me to speak to anybody about the thoughts that I was having. And what happened over the coming months, the weeks, the months, is that I, the thoughts and feelings that I was having developed into a severe self-loathing to the point where I thought that everybody around me disliked me. I couldn't possibly imagine anybody wanting to spend time with me. Um, the people that did show me kindness or, or any sort of help, my friends, my family, who did genuinely care for me, I believed that I was a burden on them. And it, it got to the point where the only way I could see the situation being resolved was that if I took myself out of the picture. And I often hear people talk about suicide and they, they say that it could be the coward's way out or that it's a selfish thing to do. And for me, that was never the case at all because I had no intrinsic desire to end my life, which is probably the only reason why I'm still standing here now. But I felt as though I needed to do it. I felt as though I needed to do it for the people around me because I was a, this huge burden on them and they couldn't possibly want to spend time with me and they, they, it would just be better for everyone if I wasn't around. And I made a decision and I made a decision that I was going to kill myself. And I started living my life in, in a very different way to, to how I had in the past. And there were several occasions where I came very close to doing so. And one that um, I've spoken about in the media previously is uh, I was on a, uh, a mid-season break with some of my teammates. I was in Dubai. And the, the strange thing about this story is that I'd actually had a really good week. I'd had a great week with my friends. We'd been out. We'd been partying. I'd been seeing lots of people who I knew out there. I'd had a really good time, and on one night, I came back to our, our hotel. We had an apartment up on maybe the 15th or 16th floor. My friends went to bed, and I found myself out on the balcony. And I, I didn't make a conscious decision that now is the time to do it. But I find myself climbing over the edge of the balcony, and I was hanging off the side of the balcony. And then the next thing I know, one of my teammates came out and grabbed me, pulled me back over, pulled me into the room, and, and was just... I just remember him holding on to me and just shouting at me, what are you doing, what are you doing? And I, I just said, oh, I, I, and I was crying. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was, I was just joking. I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to do it. I, that was it. And that was the last that we ever spoke about it until about two months ago when it came out in the papers. And that's probably the most sensational story of, of, of how I came so close. But for me, what was actually the hardest was the day-to-day -day life that I was living. And my behavior became increasingly erratic, and uh, I, as, a, as a professional athlete, you become very um, disciplined, and you, you, consistency is the key, I suppose. And I started drinking huge amounts. I started going out midweek, turning up at training hungover. Uh, I was drink driving. I was taking drugs, which probably doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but as a professional athlete, you regularly get tested. And uh, sort of the worst case scenario is that you get banned for four years. And on one occasion, I went out on a Saturday night, did a load of cocaine, turned up at training on Monday, got drug tested, naturally failed the test. Unfortunately for me, it was an out of competition test. So if it was in competition, I would have been banned for four years. I was 27 at the time, so that would effectively have been the end of my career. Um, fortunately for me, and at the time it felt like a lot of bad luck, but it was probably a lot of good luck, I got sent to see a psychiatrist and I got fined quite a lot of money and I sat down and I saw the psychiatrist and I explained to him the feelings that I was having and he quite calmly explained that I was depressed and, and it was perfectly natural and perfectly normal considering the circumstances and I remember sitting there and, and looking at him and it, it, this doesn't make any sense because I've just told you that I was pretty much at the point of killing myself but I, I sat there and I thought I'm not depressed, do you not, do you not know who I am, do you not know I'm a professional athlete? And he pri prescribed me with some antidepressants, and I, I, I didn't take the prescription. I went away, and I thought about it, and I did a bit of research myself, and it took probably all of five minutes to confirm his diagnosis and for me to realize that, yeah, I was pretty, pretty badly depressed. And at that point, this is probably where the second part of my story begins. I made a decision then that even though I knew I was depressed, I didn't want to take antidepressants, and I thought, I'm going to treat my, my depression like I would treat any injury that I'd ever received in the past. So I started researching and I started researching things that you can do to improve your own mental health. And what I found was that virtually everything on the list 
would not only improve my mental health, but it would actually make me a better athlete as well. And that's where my DPhil at the Department of Psychiatry here comes in. So obviously with a, with a PhD, your research has to be very specific. So my research is using mindfulness uh, as a method of improving resilience in depression, uh, resilience in elite athletes to depression, um, and then secondarily how that might affect their performance. And as I said, the vast majority of things that you can do to improve your mental health, like we all know, um, exercise, eating a healthy, balanced diet, making sure that we sleep well. Like our brain is essentially an organ that needs to be nurtured just like the rest of our body, our heart, our lungs, we have to treat it as such. And often when you mention mindfulness or meditation in a room full of people, half of them sort of roll their eyes and switch off and aren't interested, and then the other half are, are quite interested and want to hear more. And for me, I don't really mind what people's preconceived ideas about meditation are. It's been a tool that has, has transformed my life. And even if you don't buy into the spiritual nature of, of traditional meditation from, from the Buddhist philosophy, what it does do is it develops uh, metacognition. So metacognition is thinking about our own thoughts, which, which might seem a fairly abstract concept, but if you take it back to where I was when I was extremely depressed as a rugby player, if I was able to think about the thoughts that I was having and to not actually accept them as a fact, and instead of me thinking I'm this terrible person and then that becoming the reality, if I had the ability back then to actually think, am I a terrible person? Maybe I should ask somebody else. Maybe I should vocalize the thoughts that I'm having and have a conversation with somebody. And maybe it wouldn't have got me to the point where I was, I was willing to, to commit suicide. Um, and what else, the other thing that it does is it, it develops a strong sense of attentional control. Now, our brains are wonderful things. And they've, throughout our evolution, they've uh, developed a sense of keeping us safe, which means that they very much attend to the threats around us. And that's a fantastic thing, and that's why we're all here, because our ancestors have had this amazing brain that keeps us safe, and we've passed on our genes down, and that's why we're all sat in this room now. But generally, at least in this country, we're not in any physical threat day to day. But what happens is, and if you use the example of you get up in the morning and you go to university or you go to work, and you might have 10 interactions with people. Nine of those interactions are great, and one of them might not be. You might have a bit of an awkward conversation with someone, or you have an un uncomfortable conversation with a boss or a coworker, and then you go off to lunch, and when you sat there, you're not thinking about the nine great conversations that you've had. You're thinking about the one conversation you had that didn't go too well. And that's an evolutionary mechanism that we have, which has kept us safe, but isn't very useful in today's modern society. And what metacognition and attentional control does is allows us to identify what we're thinking about and then bring it back to the present moment. So if you sat having your lunch, instead of ruminating about the conversation that you had with your boss that went terribly, it'll bring you back to the present. You're either having a conversation with your coworker, you're eating your sandwich, you're actually focusing on eating your sandwich and enjoying the taste of the sandwich rather than ruminating and making the process worse of the, of the one little strange interaction that you had earlier on. And I think... So what I would like to leave you on is, as an athlete, it is very easy to, to, to bring in many of the things that I've talked about because you already optimize your life to make yourself as physically, po as, uh, as physically strong as possible. And then also, you, you generally have come across sports psychology before, so adding a little bit more to improve your mental health maybe isn't the hardest thing to do. For other people who sit on a spectrum of healthy and, and non-healthy, so to speak, it might be a little more different. But I think generally talking about, and, uh, and as Dave spoke about, changing the way that we think about mental health and treating our mental health in the same manner that we treat our physical health, we all generally know what we need to do to keep ourselves physically healthy. So let's start learning about what we need to do to keep ourselves mentally healthy, make little changes throughout the day, uh, develop a sense of metacognition, so learning about yourself, learning about uh, your own emotional your own emotions and developing emotional intelligence. And then whether or not you are somebody who wants to meditate or needs to meditate, learning how to adjust your attention from focusing on negative things to focusing more on the present moment. And I think that will help us all navigate what is essentially an extremely complex modern world that we live in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now I'm, I'm going to open the floor to basically if anyone's got any questions for our, our speakers. So yeah, we've got another mic that we can 
can bring to you if anyone's got any anyone wants to start I know the first question is always the uncomfortable one hey thank you my name is Felix I'm a soldier and I've been a soldier for about 33 years first of all thank you Harry Dave a great fantastic I, I got a Karen I got a Ken, I'm sorry, I've got a question for you. First of all, thank you. Thank you for your honesty and, and for opening up. Um, and it's to do with stigma. Um, and, you know, we, we struggle in the forces to get over the stigma of getting people to treat their psychological and mental health in the same way as they do with their physical health. No one thinks twice about listening to the coach about increasing their performance in terms of physical fitness or making themselves more physically stronger. But it's completely different trying to break in and get people to think about their mental resilience and their mental health in the same way. I think it's more important for elite sportsmen because you have a role um, uh, as role models for people that watch you in a way that we don't. So I, I guess my question is a long way of asking a question. Um, how are we getting on with changing that stigma within elite sport? And I guess rugby is probably a place where it would be one of the most difficult places to get through that. Yeah, I think... I think that's a really good question, and maybe over the last five or six years since I had, I had my real problems, I think there's been some fantastic campaigns breaking down stigmas. Um, I still would find it very difficult to believe that any individual athlete would be willing to hold their hand up in the middle of their playing career and go to the boss at the top and say, you know what, I'm struggling, I need a week off, or I need, I need this, or I need that. Because ultimately, it's such a highly competitive environment that as soon as somebody does that, someone's going to take your position and then it will arguably make your situation worse. Um, I also think that whilst our awareness of mental health is starting to increase quite well in sport and, and I think in the forces as well, I think our actual, un actual understanding of the things that need to be changed just isn't anywhere near good enough. Um, and I think whilst you say that it's particularly important for athletes, Obviously, my research and my, my sort of knowledge is, is very much in athletes because, because that's where I come from. But I think I would argue that the forces, that there are far more people in the forces than there are, in, uh, uh, than there are professional athletes. Uh, and I would argue that it's more important for it to happen in that domain. So sort of to ask you a question, what, what do you think that it's, how do you think that it is in, in the forces? Has there been much change over the last four or five years as there has been, at least at a super professional level in professional sport? Um, I don't want to hug the mic, but, but yes, there is change. There's change happening, and it's change happening for the top, for the good. Uh, in my career, we've, we've had um, some significant um, stuff happening. Harry, what you were saying, that middle bit, we have a thing called trauma and risk management. We, we try and re ensure we don't block that out, particularly for people coming back from operations and during events and operations. Uh, and, um, but we, we've got a long way to go, and it's exactly the same. I've just come back from the U.S. forces for a long time, and their very good program of dealing with um, people with traumatic brain injuries, in particular, and, and PTSD, it, the people seeking help are all people at the end of their career because they're worried about what it'll do to their career to be seen to be weak or to fall off that career path. Uh, and almost all of those guys going through that, they were predominantly guys. There's, there's a few um, female soldiers going through it as well, but um, uh, are at the end of their career unfortunately. And we've got to change that. It's we very, have to change the point where people go and get themselves fit in the same way as they would go and see a physical training instructor. So you, we've got to get to the same place where we've removed that stigma and people just feel it's okay to go and make themselves strong. I just thought if I chip in there, what's ticking away in my head while I was thinking of that. If we think in the Oxford context, I think we see that a lot in education and academia as well, that people are not wanting to bring things up in the middle of their degree because of that fear of how we'll be judged. And I think that's one of the boundaries that we really need to try and break down and see that kind of as a student body, it's okay in the middle of your degree to go to, to your welfare officer or, or your, your tutor or whoever and say, you know what, I'm having a crap time. And you don't have to wait until breaking point. We've seen uh, numerous examples of people finishing their degrees and then kind of everything coming out then, just like Hinnan was saying. And I think what we need to work on as a university and some of the campaigns that we're doing, and hopefully I'd love to have people here involved, is kind of encouraging people to go, all right, yeah, I'm in the middle of 
whatever level of study I am, and I want to be respected in that. But that doesn't mean, you know, taking some time off doesn't mean that I'm not a good academic. Taking time off means you're looking after yourself, and if you'd got, I know I hate, usually hate this, like, kind of comparison, but if you'd broken your leg and had to take time off because you couldn't get to the lecture theatre, you wouldn't sit and think, oh, everyone thinks I'm the worst student ever and I'm bad in my field. You'd just think, oh, I got a bit of rubbish luck and I'm not very well. And I think it's something that's, that is comparable between all these domains that we're seeing here, military, sport, academia, all of them. It's just that encouraging people to take that time and not seeing it as weakness. Uh, have we any other questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question about like, the taking up of space to talk specifically about men's mental health. Um, it's interesting to see that this, I mean, you're a woman who's provided some top cover to have this conversation, but there's a lot of this, um, I mean, uh, yeah, I think ge ge just generally, like there is pushback in some ways of talking about this and prioritizing the masculinity element of that. Um, and I mean, I, I think there's a very good justification was made that like it, this will prevent men from not only harming themselves and harming others, but how do you sort of, I mean, to, to all of you, how do you sort of navigate that of saying that this is something that should be prioritized and talked about as, as such? Okay, um, I'll start. <laughs> I've got the mic. One of the things um, that often happens in conversations about mental health is that we talk about it as though it's an individual, individual internal pathology. And actually, once you start exploring it, hearing the personal stories, you realize that some of what we're talking about is the invasion of the outside world into our minds. Um, and therefore, if in part that's what we need to address, because no one here so far this evening has said, well, I kind of think there was something that made me genetically predisposed to this. That's not the kind of frame that people often use. Um, even if there is some kind of element of, well, there's a genetic correlation, the thing that most people will tell you is about the story of what's happened to them. And therefore, the individualized way in which we approach this is partly the problem. So kind of what I do in order to kind of help navigate um, the, the field in the way they describe is to try and bring us back to kind of pull the lens back out and say, let's not just look at this kind of individualized mental pathology. Let's look at what's problematic about some of the things that are happening in our field or in our society that kind of leads to this and then allows that invasion of these problems into the individual. Um, and then most people can kind of work with that. I actually think, like, yeah, I think that's really good because you've just sparked a thought of, uh, I just read a book recently about uh, the importance of like narratives because like, actually we're in like, quite a chaotic world and shit and like you can't really make any sense out of that. Uh, and actually like narratives and stories help make chaos understandable. And I think that's why actually why there is quite a lot of toxic masculinity because it's not like the Second World War and you can go, oh, bloody Jerry. You know what I mean? Like there was, there was a shared enemy then, but there kind of isn't now. And the enemy's kind of like almost in your own uh, head. And I think that's why uh, sort of the persistence of uh, toxic masculinity and the sort of man up and stuff. Uh, and, and I think um, I'm always kind of, I'm always dubious to bring in the male thing um, purely because... Um, was a horrible anorexia in particular eating disorders. That's the only thing that I know. Uh, th there was quite a lot of research into it, but it was only in the 90s uh, that we really realised that men could properly get anorexia, and that's actually when like people are like, "Oh, if men can get it, it must be legitimate." So there is a, a real kind of horrible. Hit. I hate to say it, but that is that is absolutely true. So I feel a huge burden of guilt, and I think as we move further and further away from gender binaries, uh, I think. Uh, that that's going to be really, really helpful. So I never really try and talk about it too much in gendered terms. But in terms of moving on, and to kind of go back to Felix's question as well, uh, just something that I was saying is, like, I think people in general uh, now, um, I think one of the biggest problems is, like, uh, people realising that they have a problem, like Kiernan was saying, like, you know, actually realising you can never take a holiday from your own brain. So how could you know that you are feeling rubbish because you're feeling it all the time. So that's normal by necessity. 
So it takes a while to realize you've got a problem. And actually, I think a really nice way of doing that is helping people help themselves. Control the controller was put the control back in their hand. And instead of saying, like, we're trying to impose this on you, say, like, look, we're just trying to think of a way that you can work better as human machines, essentially. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I think in terms of breaking down gender stereotypes, it's, it's not a case of just trying to uplift women and, uh, and say women should be CEOs, women should be builders, they, they can do whatever they want. It's also breaking down the stereotypes of what men should be and that they, they don't need to be these stern-faced, hard-nosed blokes. And I think an event like this is, is contributing to that. And, con and like you saw the statistics earlier about far more men commit suicide, far more men commit murders. Is that genetic? Probably not. Is it a, a, a result of the society and the, the stereotypes that we live in? It's probably more likely that it is. Yeah, and just because you, you mentioned with me being being female and deciding to do this, I actually remember when I ran for this role, I put um, men's mental health on my, my manifesto as one of my priorities, and I got met with, you do know people are going to go mad at you for, for saying that. I don't think that's necessarily true. Anyone that has had a, any kind of interaction with me knows I'm a badass northern feminist, um, and women's rights are something that's one of the most important things to me, but men's mental health is something that's important to literally every member of society. And the issue is it's not that men's mental health is more, uh, more of an important topic than people of other genders, but, and I also don't necessarily like the gender binary, but in the society we're in at the moment, we are seeing that people who identify as men are much less likely to get help because we uphold the normal narrative of kind of focusing down the, the women's route. And I think that in an ideal world, it's kind of like Dave and, and Harry Ankin and have said, in an ideal world, I would love it that it wasn't necessary to gender things. That is my dream and we will get there, I hope. Um, but the kind of thing, situation we're in at the moment is that gender stereotypes do have an impact on mental health and we can't kind of ignore that. And I think one of the ways that we're going to move past the gender binary is by sitting down and breaking down these stereotypes and going, yeah, you know, it's all right if you identify as a bloke and you're struggling. That's fine. It's not an intrinsic part of your identity that's broken. It's, it's being human. So I think that's kind of my perspective, is, as you said, of me as a woman wanting to do this. Thank you. Um, I've got a question for Kiernan, if I may. Um, I find the link between elite sportsmen and mental health quite interesting. And I'm wondering if, excuse me, through your research, you saw any correlation between either people going on long tours away from home, um, like Marcus Triscothic being the best example, and retirement, so after don't like basically living your entire life devoted to one thing, and when you stop quite early, you know, mid-30s, I guess, whether there's any impact there, whether there, yeah, basically, any link between those two. So as far as I'm aware, in terms of going away on long tours, I don't think there's any research on that. I've certainly not come across any, but I know anecdotally, and it's interesting you mentioned Marcus Trishkosti. One, one of my friends plays cricket for England, and I know that cricketers spend huge amounts of time away from their family, and I know that he, he personally doesn't like it. So I think, I think that is probably a good point. Uh, when it comes to retirement, we were actually discussing this earlier, and retirement is a really big indicator for the vast majority of professional athletes do struggle with depression uh, when they retire. And what generally tends to happen is if that retirement is forced, as you alluded to, so if you uh, are injured and you have to retire early, or you get to the end of your career and essentially nobody wants you and you don't get a contract, it becomes, it, it makes it more difficult. I, I have stepped away from the professional game, I haven't fully retired, um, but even even though I had I had contracts, I th it worked as well as I, it possibly could for me. I had contract offers, I had a job offer, and then I had the DPIL offer. So I pretty much could choose the route that I wanted to take. And I still found it extremely difficult over summer when all my teammates were, were training and I was sat in my flat on my own on a Tuesday morning. I really started questioning, what, what, who am I now? What am I now? Um, and I think it all kind of circles around the, the, the kind of your, your own identity and your own sense of self. And retiring from sport is something that, that definitely makes you question that. Thank you. Um, uh, I guess in a, in a number of different ways, we've talked about the, the 
analogy between like mental and physical health and to what extent you can conceptualize mental health problems as physical ones and if that's a useful analogy is it is it practical and uh yeah i was wondering if you could all comment on how you how useful an idea you think that is and then another thing just a very particular thing that came in when you mentioned meditation and a spiritual element of that and you were sort of talking about it kind of independent of that whether whether you kind of take that thing or not do you think is that something that you get out of it personally and do you think there's uh, something to be said for that as an aspect to mental health in that sense yeah, so I, I actually went out to Nepal this year and did a five-day retreat at a Buddhist monastery and kind of learned it from the beginning and essentially spent five days in silence and meditated for several hours a day. Um, and and I, I personally absolutely buy into it. And there's, there's actually some really interesting research um, that says that loving-kindness meditation, particularly not just mindfulness where you focus on a single point, but actually... Um, focusing your attention on giving the world loving kindness or giving your loved ones loving kindness um, actually increases the length of telomeres which are essentially the caps on top of DNA that um, slow down aging and there's some fairly robust evidence to suggest that if you can cultivate compassion within yourself it actually slows down um, your own aging um, and then I can't remember what the first part of the question was uh, it was about the uh, physical health analogy uh, yes, I think, as I mentioned, I think everybody sits on a spectrum of, of how sort of objectively healthy they are with people who maybe don't eat very healthily, don't exercise, drink a lot of alcohol, smoke, and then elite athletes essentially on the other end. So it's very easy to, to use that analogy if you're an elite athlete because you don't have to make that many changes. Um, if you're at the other end of the spectrum, the changes that you have to make to your daily life are, are much more significant and probably a lot harder to make. But then because of that... Um, effects can be far more profound for both your physical health and your mental health. And I think that, that one of the problems with mental health is that we have this very much abstract idea of, of consciousness and mental health. When nobody really knows what consciousness is. It, we don't have a part of the brain that we, n we know where it is. So it becomes def very difficult to pinpoint what the problem is. Um, so I think if you do start, start putting in more objective measures of of treating your mental health like physical health, and I can speak only really from my personal experience that it can be hugely transformative. Um, just kind of want to share something um, before I answer your question, which is um, I'm a, a 400 meter specialist um, and it's kind of age related. So I run at a national level um, and like a couple of years ago got medals. The point wasn't to kind of get glory for that, but just ju just because like of the commonality and I also do a lot of meditation and um, in fact this weekend was just on there's something called five rhythms dancing which is a movement form of meditation and can kind of really concur with a lot of what you talk about about like you know things that um, really help us both physically and mentally to shift stuff through us so yeah that was kind of really great to hear in answer to your question the first thing I would say is the idea of the mind body split around mental health doesn't really work. Um, so people who critique this area would kind of go back to Descartes, um, René Descartes' work, French philosopher, who kind of you know, conceptualized this mind-body um, kind of dualism. Um, but actually, in the field of mental health, increasingly, we're recognizing that that isn't the way we're made up. So there's a lot of information now emerging about how gut flora, the bacteria in our gut, affects um, you know, the likelihood of us being depressed or inflammation on the brain um, being linked with depression or if you experience trauma, how that can create physical lesions on the brain or if you know people are going through a lot of pain, physical pain, then unsurprisingly it affects the likelihood of them being depressed. So this kind of Cartesian dualism of this is body and this is mind doesn't really make sense and the science is now catching up with what people have been telling us for years. That's the first part of it. The second part is that that analogy depoliticizes the experience of mental health problems. So for example, in our um, sector in, in mental health, um, you know, I spoke about some of the kind of raised um, rates of mental health problems amongst people um, from black, Asian, and minority backgrounds. And we know many of those people, I said before, will have experienced violence and um, discrimination and poverty, and there's a link. Or we know that um, 
85% of the women on our inpatient wards are survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Um, and, you know, some of that will have been as um, adult women, and we kind of know about sexual violence and physical violence against women, and how that's closely correlated with the likelihood of people being admitted. So I can kind of give you a lot of data around that. And the point is, is that there's a certain demographic who are likely to experience mental problems far more frequently because of some of those social factors that I've been kind of uh, alluding to. So to then just say, oh, it's a bit like a broken leg, depoliticizes that element of it because the kind of sexual violence and stuff actually is related to patriarchy and some of the kind of toxic masculinity. So I really try and move away from trying to use that analogy for those reasons. Yeah, I, I, I think that's very warranted. Before I start, I do want to say uh, I hold no medals and I'm yet to find my skill in life. But I, I kind of completely agree with what you're saying. And like uh, D uh, Descartes um, does have a lot to sort of, I, I genuinely think, so I get really bored about philosophy and stuff, but yeah, Descartes was like with the mind-body duality split when actually subsequently really funny little, well, it's not funny, but Descartes genuinely thought the duality was so much that he uh, very uh, like commonly, and it happened more than once, he used to saw horses in half. And people were like, what? And he used to do that to show, I <laughs> know, mental, right? And, um, and he said that when they were screaming out in pain, that was the same, it was just an instinctual reaction in the same way when you pop a balloon, it makes a sound. And that shows how absurd that duality is because we know that's not true, he was mental. But you can't, not all philosophers are mental. People like Wittgenstein, who's a pretty big dog, said that language is your tool to carve out the world. And I think that is very true. And building on that, Immanuel Kant, again, mental German bloke, uh, but he said that you can only access the world enough. Now, the reason that I'm pointing that out is not to try and look good at something. The reason I'm pointing that out is that you can only get so far with something that is ephemeral. Trying to explain the mental is really, really, uh, is really, really difficult. And I think sometimes in an, uh, an analogous uh, sort of use can be useful because I think it's all based on context. I mean, we are at Oxford University, one of the best universities in the world, definitely better than Cambridge. Um, and we are here now when we are talking about it. I used to work at a radio station for builders. If I had said, Wittgenstein went, said this, I would not have finished the sentence before I was called a prick and told to shut up. So it's kind of, I think it depends on where you're using that analogy, to what end, but always acknowledging that any analogy, doesn't have to be with mental health, whatever, any analogous quote is limited because you're not talking about that thing. It's an Aristotelian fallacy. Look at these big words. But it can help you get so far, but it can't help you access that thing. Uh, thanks for all three of you being here tonight. It's been very uh, insightful. I'm from Australia and just uh, on the sporting point, I'm um, a big sports fan. I remember Jonathan Trott, I think, left the Ashes tour uh, early and Steve Harmison was homesick. And in Australia, you know, we're some of us, I suppose, the, the reputation is you, you don't talk about your feelings, but the media was very supportive of those decisions. Uh, conversely, it was seen as perhaps a psychological advantage to Australia. So there was still that that reticence to actually admit those feelings uh, in sport. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about your, your backgrounds. How receptive have you felt the community and the media has been to the three of you? Now, I know that some people have experience as um, mental health workers, or social work, but I'm from Australia and I do some work in mental health and I just wonder, have you felt media in particular has been very receptive to your stories and narratives? So the, the, the balance between your lived experience uh, against perhaps being a professional in mental health or a combination of the both? I, uh, personally, I think I, I, I've been incredibly lucky. I know I spoke about two bad experiences uh, earlier on, but my experience has been nothing but 
wonderful and, and, uh, and amazing. And I, I've been incredibly privileged in that because I know not everyone's like that. But because of that, I genuinely now, the people that I actually want to reach are the kind of Piers Morgans and the, the Katie Hopkins purely because I feel like the dialogue is getting a little bit stretched of if you say something, you know, that's wrong, you're a bad person. But I actually think people that are like, uh, you know, sort of not of the mindset that, I, and I've, I've met loads of people that don't think that you have mental health, like genuinely like there, there's no such a thing. It's been created and it's been created to, you know, cold us. Um, I think it's a better, a nicer, and definitely a more effective way, instead of saying to someone, you're naughty for saying that, actually saying, okay, why do you think that? What elements of that are you bringing to the table? And say, oh, I can, I can see that, and shimmying alongside them and saying, oh, you know, I can, you know, that element of that is that. But if you, a great example we always get with eating disorders is people sort of saying uh, it's attention-seeking because it's about vanity. And I can kind of, to be honest, to understand, I sort of understand where that comes from because, you know, people think you're trying to get nice with the prom, but actually underpinning that is a deeper seated feeling of not feeling good enough and actually trying to do whatever you can to make yourself feel valuable and valued. So I think it's kind of like shimmying alongside. I've been very lucky. And I'm, anyone else? No, these guys have had it crazy. Um, a couple of things uh, in response to that. Firstly, that different people and different social groups will have a different experience of this. So um, I've done a lot of work with Frank Bruno. Frank Bruno, if you don't know, was um, a kind of professional boxer for years and was a kind of British idol. And, you know, I've got a DVD where I kind of interviewed him and kind of heard his story and stuff. Um, but the kind of interesting thing is that his experience, even though he was a quote-unquote celebrity, he was still taking it, oh, he was a big bloke and very strong, so I get that. But he was still taken in um, with a lot of police and it was splashed across the um, Sun newspaper, bonkers Bruno locked up. Um, and his experience as a black celebrity was different. So there's that kind of dimension about actually our experiences will be different. And often the stories that hit the media um, around people are known in public life aren't the ones where it might be around psychosis explicitly. Um, so there's a group of people who experience real difficulties in kind of making sense of the world um, and our reality aligning with theirs. And those people experience a kind of degree of hostility. And it is interesting that, as I say, you don't really hear that many so-called celebrities kind of talking about psychosis. Yeah, that was a fascinating point, really interesting. Um, my, my personal experience has been largely positive and I think I've been very lucky. Um, what I've found off the back of that is the amount of people that reached out to me from, from every walk of life, other athletes in different sports, just general members of the public. And, and the thing that probably personally affected me the most was the amount of uh, my ex-teammates and people who I played with and against who got in touch with me with um, similar stories. In, in one particular case, a, a, a far much... Uh, worst story and, and I played with this guy for two years and I had absolutely no idea about it and it, it, I sat there reading his messages crying because I was just so so sad that I had no idea of what he went through but then in terms of me opening up and speaking out I think it came at the right time because people are generally a lot more aware of mental health um, issues and um, and yeah I think because of that it, it's been a lot more receptive. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask for some advice on marketing in particular. Um, so we have lots of events in our college that are aimed towards male mental health, uh, but there's a real struggle to get men to get down there. A lot of uh, guys recognize that mental health is a problem for men, and they recognize that they're more um, susceptible to it, but they still don't want to talk about it. So what are your views on this? Then? I, I, I personally say, like, make it fun. 
And there's an amazing charity called uh, Five Aside Chess. It's basically a new type of chess that they've created that's more simple, more stripped back. And they go around the, the, the sort of country in a bus and whatever. Um, and because it's a new type of chess, you have to learn how to play it. And because it's easier, then it's more accessible. But as you're learning how to play it, that opens up the conversation. Because actually just sitting opposite someone and going, how are you? Fucking hell, that's intimidating. <laughs> but I've, I've met like uh, psychologists and so that use uh, PlayStation. They'll play like Call of Duty and they'll go, I've never played this, teach me how to play it. Someone's teaching them, there's building that bond and then you're not staring at each other. I saw a psychiatrist that said once, uh, if ever he's looking at people, at all, if ever he's like assessing someone, he'll always go for a walk because actually just walking side by side someone is a lot less intimidating than the power dynamic of being opposite them. So my personal thing is lead with fun. There's, there's YouTube, you can watch YouTube videos out there. There's, um, there's games that you can engage. Even, I know it's a bit childlike in that, but I love it, uh, Inside Out. Uh, it's, it's a great film. Disney, all about emotions, emotional regulation. I, bottom line, I'm a very lazy person, and I will never do anything if it's boring. So make it fun, and nothing is more fun than good mental health, and there's loads of ways that you can do that. So I think lead with entertainment. Yeah, my answer is gonna be kind of similar, not as, uh, not as exciting as that, but um, immense help seeking behavior is, is generally pretty poor, so I'd suggest do it in tandem with an event that you're already holding, whether it's a, a sports event, a, a rugby game, a football game, a college game, or something that's going on, and then have it in tandem with that, with, with the other exciting fun things, and I think you're onto a winner. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing to kind of um, work with is the reality that for most people, the word mental has an association with being what people talk about colloquially as being mental. So, so, so you're onto a loser once you start to introduce that concept, that like, if you come to that, the implication is that you must be mental. Um, it's not a, use, a word I use in a pejorative way, but that, uh, that's the kind of discourse. So I entirely agree. Find something that doesn't talk about mental in it, but gets to it. A little, a little example of that is like one of my mates is like, just a tiny little thing on that, but like one of my mates is a uh, recovering alcoholic. And he sort of said all of the events he goes to are like no alcohol events. <laughs> it's like you've actually marketed that as taking something away. Whereas actually if you give something back as like a, a pro fun night, I mean, that's a shit idea, but <laughs> you, you, you can come up with a better idea instead of it saying like, or oh, it's a you know, negative connotation, instead of it just being fun or wellness or well-being or something blokey and silly, I'd, I'd definitely go to that. It'd be a laugh. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Harry in that um, I was very in interested in what you were saying about the intersection between um, ethnicity and gender um, in terms of access to, and, uh, to support. Um, I suppose the natural conclusion to that is that um, black men or BAME men um, are some, are, will find it very difficult indeed and um, perhaps the, 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 the hardest um, and does that but does that play out in your experience? Yes, yeah, so um, the evidence kind of shows um, that the dark skinned you are, the more likely you are to have adverse experiences. So there's some research by someone called Cantor Gray that kind of looked at immigrant communities and like all immigrant communities have an excess use, but the darker skinned you are, you're likely to be at the top of um, that. So that's kind of well established and I've got a load of data that supports that. So that's true. Um, what I was also kind of hinting at around the intersectionality thing is that there are some kind of cultural practices that might make this more difficult. So without demonizing any particular population group, homophobia, say, might be really stronger in some communities and we can kind of go back to like what colonization did to kind of bring religion and that actually this is the legacy of that. So it's not about blaming communities. But where that might still be there in a very explicit way, of course you're gonna get a lot more people suppressing aspects of who they are. But not only that, if people are feeling policed all the time, that's gonna be toxic. So when I say about, let's kind of investigate some of the current cultural practices or the things that are put to the fore. So some of the music forms 
that might be really big in Caribbean culture, will push forward a particular model of masculinity, which doesn't mean we can't say, oh, dance hall's bad or hip hop's bad, um, but actually to kind of start to critique it and say, how healthy is this? And to find ways to, to shift it. So, you know, like Dave was saying, I might not say, don't listen to hip hop, but I might choose to find as much hip hop that's, you know, common or telequally or, you know, somebody who's going to say something sensible um, and put that to the fore. So thank you. So we'll we'll stop there wi with the questions, um, and I'll just say a quickly a, a few thank yous. So thanks again to our uh, wonderful speakers. I'm sure you'll agree this has been really insightful. So can we again show our uh, thanks to them? <laughs> also, thank you to you all for coming. Um, can't have an event if no one turns up to look. So cheers, um, and yeah, thanks. Just a quick shout out, they couldn't be here, but the Exeter Welfare Reps, because they, uh, JCI Welfare Reps, because they booked the venue for us and have been wonderful. So there's some uh, soft drinks and leaflets about various mental health organizations and also um, a student production of Hamlet that's going on in order to raise money for CALM, which is the campaign against living miserably. Uh, it's a charity that focuses on uh, male suicide. So please do take drinks and stay around and chat if you want to, or just take drinks and run, because I don't want to carry them back to the SU. Um, take the leaflets, have a look, any information, and please, yeah, just have a think about what we've heard, but thank you for coming. <laughs>